Tonight, growing Western calls for Israel to avoid invading Rafah as Israeli forces move the fight out of Gaza's busiest hospital. The latest from the Middle East. Plus, it's a pretty insidious type of warfare that we see being used against our, our personnel. The new report highlighting Russia's links to the mysterious Havana syndrome. And what we're after here is not demographic increase. What we're after is real followers of Jesus. A mission to plant churches to carry out the Great Commission. All this and more tonight on Faith Nation. Reports of an Israeli airstrike target senior Iranian officials in Syria. Good evening in Washington. I'm Jenna Browder. A stunning escalation in the Middle East as Israel's war with Hamas rages on. Today, an airstrike on Iran's consulate in Damascus. Syrian and Iranian officials say the attack killed two Iranian generals and five others. According to the New York Times, the strike targeted a secret meeting between Iranian, uh, Iran, Iran and Hamas leaders. While Israel, Israeli officials refused to comment on the incident, Iran's ambassador has threatened a fierce response to the attack. Meanwhile, the U.S. and Israel met virtually today to discuss the Biden administration's alternative proposals to a full-scale IDF invasion of Rafah. The meeting was supposed to happen last week. However, Netanyahu canceled it in protest after the U.S. didn't veto a U.N. Security Council resolution calling for a ceasefire in Gaza and the release of all hostages. You have laid out our concerns about this for some time, and I think it's important uh, that both sides are, are having this discussion. On Sunday, tens of thousands of demonstrators flooded the streets of Israel for a second night, demanding immediate elections and urgent negotiations for the release of the more than 100 hostages still being held by Hamas. The protests merged two distinct movements, one led by families of hostages pressuring the government to secure a deal, the other by political opposition calling for Netanyahu's removal. Meanwhile, Israeli forces withdrew from Gaza's largest hospital after a two-week operation. There are conflicting reports between Israeli authorities and Hamas regarding casualties and damage to medical facilities. In other news, Russia is stepping up its annual spring military conscription campaign. 150,000 citizens will be called into service. All men over 18 in Russia are required to serve for a year or get an equivalent year of higher education. As Moscow bulks up its military forces, it's also looking to the outside to help its more than two-year-long invasion of Ukraine. Iran has sent thousands of drones to attack civilians and critical infrastructure. Senior international correspondent George Thomas traveled to Odessa to bring us the story. Midnight, March 2nd, in Odessa. Anna and Timothy were in our bedroom. I was in the other room with our daughter Lisa. I usually go to her room to try and help her fall asleep. I fell asleep too with her that night. An hour later, Russia launched eight kamikaze drones from Crimea, targeting the Ukrainian port city. At about 1.17 a.m., I heard a sound, a sharp sound, like a drone, and then a sharp explosion. While Ukrainian air defenses intercepted seven drones, the eighth struck Anna and Sergei's nine-story apartment. Everything was on fire. I woke up quickly and got up, took my daughter in my arms and wrapped her in a blanket. I ran out of the room to make sure that my wife and son were safe. I saw that the door to our bedroom was open, and suddenly I noticed that the bedroom was gone. There was just an abyss and a mountain of garbage below. Search and rescue teams arrived within minutes of the attack. I was in shock. What kind of scary dream was that? Maybe it was a dream, I thought, but it was real. After 12 hours, firefighters found Anna and their four-month-old Timothy in the basement of the apartment. The structures of the seven floors came down on them, pinning them down completely. During the explosion, the bed flipped over and the mattress and blanket covered them. It's a good thing that happened. Their bodies survived. They weren't blown apart. That was important to me. The forensics later found out that they died in their sleep next to each other. It was an Iranian drone known as the Shahid 136 
that brought down Anna and Sergei's home. Earlier this month, hundreds of emails and thousands of internal documents revealed that since the war here in Ukraine began more than two years ago, Russia has purchased more than 6,000 Iranian drones. Military specialists told me that the Shahed drone was programmed from start to finish, from the point of takeoff to the point of impact. It was programmed to fly right here. A total of 12 people were killed in our apartment. This is targeted terror. According to Ukraine's Air Force, Russia has launched almost 3,800 Shahed drones over the last two years, attacking civilian targets and infrastructure like power plants. The Russian army purposefully killed my wife and my little baby. Iran is to blame too. Those who take the weapons and kill are to blame. And those who sell those weapons are also to blame. In February, hackers obtained thousands of internal documents from a company reportedly linked to Iran's defense ministry that revealed extensive technical help Tehran is providing Moscow to manufacture these Shahed drones. The Washington Post uncovered an industrial hub last August, hundreds of miles east of Moscow, where thousands of drones have been assembled. A few days ago, Russian media showed video from reportedly inside that plant with dozens of Shahed drones on display. Ukraine intelligence believes Hezbollah and members of Iran's Revolutionary Guard are also teaching Russians how to operate the drones. Anna was a sunshine person for all of us. She enjoyed life. She loved the world. She loved God. CBN News was there last week as hundreds of Christians came to this church in Odessa to pay their last respects to Anna and Timofey. Anna's father is a well-known pastor in the city. God gave us life and we rejoiced in it. We praised God, we served in church. She was very active in the church's ministry. Ukraine's President Zelensky also laid flowers near their destroyed apartment building and mentioned the sadness he felt of Timofey's passing in a tweet. First of all, I have no anger towards the Russians. There is no aggression and no desire for revenge. Second, I have no anger towards God. I don't have any questions. Of course, humanly speaking, it is very hard to accept this. But God, almost on this day of the funeral, when we were waiting for a miracle, he sent peace into my heart. George Thomas, CBN News, Odessa, Ukraine. An amazing testament of faith. Well, tonight, there are new questions circulating about Russia and the mysterious illness known as Havana syndrome. After a five-year investigation, CBS News reports all evidence points to the Kremlin. But as national security correspondent Caitlin Burke reports, there are still a lot of questions. Caitlin? Jenna, for years, many suspected China as the culprit behind mystery attacks, leaving U.S. officials with health issues like nausea, severe headaches, seizures, and even blindness. Now, a CBS News team from 60 Minutes reveal new evidence pointing to a Russian intelligence unit. This does sort of feel like the kind of thing that's not out of the scope of the possible with Russia in particular. According to CBS News, producers obtained a document linking an elite Russian intelligence unit to acoustic energy weapon testing. And they report proof that a suspected member of that group was in Tbilisi, Georgia, at the same time Americans there complained of Havana syndrome effects. It's an attempt to sort of cleverly put pressure on competitors or to make people fear Russia in some other way to remind the world that Russia can reach its tentacles far and wide, or maybe it's just a Russian intelligence agency a little bit out of control. Michael O'Hanlon with the Brookings Institution says the weapon believed responsible for these attacks is attractive because it largely has no signature. In the case of sonic uh, you know, weaponry, it's a little bit less easily documented. There's a little bit less of a trace there's not the same DNA signature or chemical signature or radioactive signature. In 2022, CBN News spoke with a victim of Havana syndrome. The 26-year CIA veteran says he was in a hotel room in Moscow near the U.S. Embassy when he woke up with vertigo, ringing in his ears, and nausea. 
spent a lot of time in some some really tough places in, in our war zones. This was the most terrifying experience of my life, um, you know, basically because of, of the unknown. But but something really really bad happened to me that day. While many questions remain about Havana syndrome, who's responsible, and the motive behind the attacks, O'Hanlon says he's certain those speaking out about their symptoms are telling the truth. The people who believe they've been targeted are pretty credible people. It's a lot of American diplomats, for example, who have been based in Cuba. And I have absolutely no reason to think that they were interested in making this up. Washington is divided over who could be behind these attacks. In 2022, the CIA reported it did not believe Russia or another foreign actor is responsible. The director of national intelligence echoed that assessment just last year. Still, the retired Army officer who led the Pentagon investigation agrees all evidence points to Moscow. Jenna? Caitlin, do experts think we'll ever get to the bottom of this? O'Hanlon says he believes it's possible, but it will likely take some significant leaks out of Russia or maybe even Cuba, whether that involves more documents or even a defector ready to tell us what happened. Jenna? All right, national security correspondent Caitlin Burke. Thank you very much, Caitlin. Well, tonight, an update on the Baltimore Bridge collapse. President Biden plans to head to the Port of Baltimore Friday. There's still no timeline for when the port will reopen. But the U.S. Coast Guard is set to finish a temporary channel as demolition crews work to remove mangled pieces of Francis Scott Key Bridge from the waters where it collapsed. It's a process Maryland's governor says will take a while. Now, I know there's an urgency to move fast. And nobody feels that urgency more than the people standing up here today. But we have to be clear on the risks. Every time we move a piece of the structure, the situation could become even more dangerous. We have to move fast, but we cannot be careless. And the channel will allow tugboats to help with the debris removal. The Army Corps of Engineers and the Navy are also on hand for a federal response. Some $60 million has already been released to aid in cleanup and rebuilding. Coming up, Transgender Day of Visibility. The White House facing backlash for the proclamation it released on Easter Sunday. That story and more just two minutes away. Welcome back. Election 2024. And tonight, the race between former President Trump and President Biden is the closest it's been in months. According to Real Clear Politics, Trump leads Biden by one point, 46.5 percent to 45.5 percent. Meanwhile, seven months out from Election Day, a new Bloomberg Morning Consult poll shows Biden gaining ground in six out of seven critical swing states. And here now for more, Nathan Gonzalez, editor and publisher of Inside Elections and a Faith Nation contributor. Nathan, welcome. Um, so let's start there with that Bloomberg Morning Consult poll. What do you make of Biden gaining steam in these swing states and what do you attribute it to? Well, we shouldn't be surprised, first of all, right, Jenna? I mean, we have an evenly divided country. I think our default position should be that we're going to have a very close and competitive presidential race. Uh, that being said, Biden had more ground to make up, particularly because I think there's more softness among Democratic voters. So as the general, the primaries are effectively over, the general election comes into focus, that choice becomes into focus. Some of Democrats' concerns about Biden are starting to wither away uh, in the scope of electing Trump to a second term. And so I think we're seeing Biden come up to more normal levels, which is a very competitive race in a, in a half dozen important states. Yeah. Um, the White House, Nathan, getting major flack for its Transgender Day of Visibility proclamation that it released on Easter Sunday. Um, this year, the two days, they happened to fall on the same day. But still, was this an unforced error, Nathan? And, and could there be political consequences for Joe Biden and this decision? Um, many Christians and his fellow uh, Catholics finding it very offensive. I think, President, whether it was intentional or not, President Biden, I think, managed to offend a large group of people who were probably not going to support him anyway. And those, pe those people are probably not going to forget this for a long time. That being said, I'm trying to, to zoom out and look forward to the fall. And you were asking about political consequences. I have a hard time believing that independent voters or more moderate voters are going to be focused on uh, March the 31st and, and Transgender Visibility Day and Easter, I just don't think that that's going to be the deciding factor or at the top of voters' minds, voters that are in the middle when trying to make a decision in this presidential race.
Uh, at the same time, critics of Donald Trump are pointing to some of his Easter Sunday posts on Truth Social. He was on there um, criticizing political enemies, among other things. Um, critics say, Nathan, it wasn't very Christian of him. What do you make of some of Trump's posts yesterday? Well, I'll say the critics are right, <laughs> Jenna. I mean, I don't know. People can read read the Bible how, the, how they want to read it. But to me, sadly, this is the norm for Trump, right? Personal attacks is the norm. And for, for on a day like Easter, I think... Uh, when most Christians want to focus on Jesus, de you know, death on the cross and resurrection, the hope that is found in that, and yet Trump manages to make it about himself. It's always about Trump, and this is just the latest example of that. Yeah. Uh, finally, we learned today Hope Hicks, one of Trump's closest White, uh, White House aides, will testify in, in his New York hush money trial. Um, Nathan, we know for, she's a very private person, so it's anyone's guess what she'll say. But in the time we have left, just a final thought on that. I think this is important testimony because she was as close as anyone uh, to those conversations in 2016. We haven't heard a lot from her. She's not on cable news doing a ton of interviews or writing books. And so I think that says a lot. It brings probably more weight to her testimony than what some of the other players who haven't been as close to this uh, to this case or this situation before. So it's going to be important, important testimony. Yeah, she was on the campaign trail with him in 2016, and then, of course, um, a big influence in the White House. So we will see Nathan Gonzalez of Inside Elections. Thank you, Nathan. Nice to see you. See you, Jenna. All right, a mission to plant 1,000 churches. Up next, we'll show you where and how. More Americans are opting out of Sunday morning services across the nation. According to Axios, 49% of Americans say they never or rarely attend religious services. It's part of a growing trend of people who say they don't affiliate with any religion at all. A new Pew Research survey found 8 in 10 Americans say religion is losing its influence in public life. That is the highest level ever recorded by Pew. About half say that's a bad thing and believe religion has a positive impact on American life. Well, with attendance down, many churches are closing their doors. But one North Carolina ministry has a goal to combat that trend. As Brody Carter reports, they're doing so with a mission of planting 1,000 churches in this generation. So every demographic study that I've seen of recent shows that the, the group that is growing, maybe the fastest, you know, one of the fastest at least, is this N-O-N-E group, the nuns. And um, they, they're no longer, they're very skeptical of institutionalized religion. One of the things we can get wrong is to think that they're not interested in spirituality. J.D. Greer yeah. should know, as he served as the Southern Baptist Convention president from 2018 to 2021. At its peak, the denomination grew to more than 16 million members in some 48,000 churches nationwide. Since then, a slow yet steady decline has stripped away more than 3 million of its members. Honestly, probably we're not practicing believers anyway, but they, them and then their descendants are dropping out. Some may connect this decline to internal divisions over LGBTQ rights, a sex abuse scandal, and the question over females serving as pastors. A lot of the decline in, in those numbers is just, it's cultural Christianity. But if you actually look at the statistics on the amount of, of what I would consider true disciples, those numbers are actually encouraging. Today, Greer focuses on his own ministry in Durham, North Carolina, as pastor at the Summit Church which has seen massive growth despite uncertainty in the SBC. Because of the empty tomb, our road doesn't end at the grave. If anything, it begins there for those who are in Christ. What we're after here is not demographic increase. What we're after is real followers of Jesus. To date, the Summit Church has strategically planted 75 North American churches in metropolitan cities and college towns, with more than 500 planted worldwide. Their mission is to supply these communities with a church that can proclaim and live out the gospel. Unfortunately, a lot of them are not reached um, in the church by just doing you know, great music, great guest services, and relevant sermons. A lot of them have to be reached outside the church, which means that we have to equip our members to carry the gospel outside the walls of the church. That's always been important, but it's more important than ever. Charleston Baptist Association is 270 years old and growing. Harbor Church is one of the newest additions thanks to J.D. Greer Ministries. My desire was to be used by God in my generation to be able to share the hope of the gospel in an area of need, and I found that in Charleston. 
Summit sent church planter Jonathan Lenker to start Harper City Church in Charleston, South Carolina. We came here with 35 people as a part of a launch team. We grew to about 60 and then went public on, in September 18th of 2022. Um, we've since grown. Last weekend we had 201 people here at our service. Since the 1700s, Charleston has been known as the holy city for its religious tolerance, boasting some 400 churches. Lanker, however, feels that title has lost its meaning over time. If you talk to someone who really knows the city, you'll understand that most of those churches are empty on a Sunday. The, the ultimate vision, like we will know that we fulfilled our mission, is to see the holy city holy in truth and not just in name. While the gospel remains the same, people and culture do not. This is why Greer and his network plant churches to reach new generations and help them grow. God has given the church one commission. Uh, Jesus' great commission only has one verb in it. Uh, we don't see that in English because it looks like a bunch of verbs, but the only verb is make disciples. Everything else he says in there is a participle, which means it strengthens or, or amplifies the verb. Um, the commission that God gives to the church in every generation is make disciples. Brody Carter, CBN News. All right, thank you, Brody. And still ahead, a record-breaking Easter celebration at the White House. Finally tonight, rainy weather in the nation's capital here didn't stop an Easter tradition from reaching record numbers. 40,000 people flocked to the White House today for the 144th annual Easter egg roll. Highlighting First Lady Jill Biden's career in teaching, for the third year, the event was themed egg education. The South Lawn and Ellipse transformed into a school community full of educational activities and, of course, the time-honored tradition of rolling hard-boiled eggs across the South Lawn with wooden spoons. The President and First Lady with this message about Easter. Easter reminds us of the power of hope and renewal, sacrifice and resurrection. And the American Egg Board estimated a total of 64,000 eggs were used on the lawn. That's going to do it for Faith Nation. Thank you so much for joining us. Have a great night.